Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Lydia Strike, who is making a return visit um, with more accomplishments to Harold. Um, you may recall that Lydia came uh, a year ago and a lot has changed in a year. And you have been very busy. I see that you've been uh, at the Saints and Sinners Literary Festival doing workshops. You were promoting your novel last year at the Teacher's Room. Mm -hmm. um, and are you still promoting it or do books have kind of a finite um, life where you go around and talk about them and then? Um... Well, I think that they can have a finite life, but I think that my hope is that, you know, um, when I get back to the States, I'm out of the country now that um, I will talk about the book with groups and um, organizations that were closed because of the pandemic when my book came out. It was a very odd time to have something come out because really so many institutions that might be interested in it were um, not functioning. And, mm -hmm. and it's taken much longer than I thought it would, especially in America, for things to come back to life. So yeah, I, and I, I'm still doing things with it here and there. Um, over here, and I may, I'm talking to a translator about the book in Germany soon. So all kinds of, that's good. That is good. Yeah. And you know, you're right that uh, books never stop. I mean, you know, it's in circulation now. People are going to read it, you know, for yeah. years to come. Yeah, for better or worse. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it, but now you're to where you have. We'd like to move to a totally different subject, but before we do that, I'd like to remind viewers, um, I'd like to read a little of your biography, if you don't mind, although um, most Just viewers probably already know it. Uh, Lydia Strike was born in DeKalb, Illinois, birthplace of barbed wire and flying ears of corn. She grew up between DeKalb and London, England, and as a child also lived in Japan, where she studied kabuki and performed on the stage and in Iran. So you really are a citizen of the world. After high school, she trained to be an actress at the Drama Center London, a career she pursued in New York for exactly one year before going back to school to study history, education, and later journalism. She has a PhD in theater from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, Dr. Strike. Oh, her dissertation, Acting Hysteria, an analysis of the actress and her part, was in part an attempt to understand why her own short-lived experience acting the women's part on stage felt pathological. I love that part of your bio. Uh, she's the author of over a dozen full-length plays and a few short ones which have been produced all across the United States and also in Germany and Canada. Um, you um, are the, you, uh, your plays have been produced in many places, including the English Theater Berlin, where you're an associate, artistic associate. What is an artistic associate? Uh, don't ask me. <laughs> you're kind of in a cadre of writers and exactly. your plays are produced. No, I don't know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> scenes and monologues. I'm sorry. I think it just means that they've done several of my plays and uh, so I'm someone they work with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I saw an interview about the novel, I think. Yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. That was very uh, informative. Uh, yeah. Your plays have also been anthologized in collections by Heinemann, Applause, and Smith and Krauss. Mm -hmm. And one of your plays appears in Acts of War, Iraq, and Afghanistan in seven plays. Mm -hmm. um, 
And also another play was and appeared in the anthology, Here Comes the Brides from Sealed Press. I love Sealed Press. That was fun. Yeah. Um, go ahead. They'd, um, I saw somewhere that they were looking for material and I, I think they had no intention of putting any plays in the anthology, but I had this little play that I dedicated to um, a couple that I know and loved in New York, both have passed. Um, and I, uh, they, they felt it would fit that collection nicely. I was really happy about that. And the play is called The End of Civilization as We Know It? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Sounds great. Yeah, it's about um, two women in their 70s waiting to attend their grandson's wedding and um, kind of they look back on their lives. They had both been married to other people, to men, and how they fell in love and their re the regret that they couldn't marry because they'd been friends since their youth. And it was just before marriage passed. So it was a, a moment where things hadn't quite turned in our favor. Yeah. Sounds great. Yes. So we, um, we can get some of these plays by going to Broadway Play Publishing and Dramatist Play Service. Yeah. And they're on my website. There's information about the plays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and your website will appear periodically throughout this interview, directing viewers to your work, because you really are kind of a Renaissance person. Um, oh. You, uh, besides plays and novels, you write essays and uh, mm -hmm. give presentations and do workshops. And um, yeah. I enjoyed your essays when I was uh, preparing for the last interview, the essay about the Frankfurt Book Fair. Oh. I loved <laughs> Because I always wondered what that was like. It's really such a famous event. <laughs> I enjoyed that. I, you know, it's tongue in cheek, but it's also deadly serious about this poor writer who shows up and nobody wants to talk to her. Of course, oh, the humiliation of being there, and I, I you know, I, I thought I'd get my revenge that way. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great essay. <laughs> That's fun. I like writing essays. I, I really like that form. I only came to it pretty late, you know. Um, but it's when I when I feel compelled to say something, I think it's the perfect form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really well, like when we last talked, mm -hmm. um, I asked you about your plans, and you said you were kind of involved in the novelistic enterprise that you thought you might continue writing novels, but now we have a play. So you've changed uh, genres, not that you're anyone's committed to one exclusively. So how did you happen to um, return to theater? Okay, let me explain that. Um, like all writers, um, we all have work that we have drafts of that we've written and put aside for various reasons. And so Safe House, the play we're going to be talking about today that has just been published by Broadway Play Publishing. Um, Let's it, put a picture on the screen of the cover of the yeah, play. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't see it, but that doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so it was a play that I, I wrote at a moment. I felt compelled to write it because I got kind of fascinated by these the world of espionage and these um, moles that were uncovered. Um, what were their names? Uh, wrote them down. Robert Hansen. Hansen and Aldrich Ains. Um, but, and, and people, there was interest in it and I did several things with it, but then uh, other events took over and that happens in an artist's life. So for a writer's life or whatever. And I, wrote another play um, about the Iraq war. And then I, um, the one that's in this anthology about a military family living through the Iraq war and called American Tet. And then I got run over and I wrote, eventually wrote a play about my accident where I had to <laughs> and learn to walk again and so on, which I did. And I also learned that recovery doesn't always mean walking again which was an important lesson that I learned. 
but mm-hmm. I didn't lose it happen, walk again. And, you know, so then this play was sitting there and then we came into this horrific moment um, with Russia invading Ukraine and the world kind of out of kilter again in a way it really hadn't been for a very long time. And I thought, my God, this is really the moment for which I wrote this play, Safe House. And I took it to my publisher, one of my publishers um, at Broadway Play Publishing. And luckily he felt the same. So it's, um, it, of course I went back into it as one does and, you know, looked again at it um, and, and felt that this was the moment for this play. So that's how it evolved and, and why it's published now, why it's being published now. Can you remind us a little about Robert Hansen and Aldrich Ames in there? Well, they were um, two high-level um, intelligence offers, officers. Robert Hansen was in the FBI. Um, Aldrich, Aldrich Ames was in the CIA. And for years and years, decades and decades, they were providing information to the Russians. <laughs> and um, I, they were eventually, I think um, Hansen was um, discovered first, and then that led to um, uncovering or of um, Aldra James. And I, I was interested in their um, personal lives and um, their their wives. They both had wives, and and I, that's what always triggers my imagination. The women in these stories. So it was really the wife who inspired um, my play Safe House. And so as I imagined it, um, there is this high level intelligence officer and his wife, and um, they welcome into their home um, a cultural attache from another country. And I don't identify the country because I like to leave things open when possible because this third character, this cultural attache, this woman from somewhere else, she could be from many, many places. So in other words, many, many um, female actors, um, actresses could play that role. Um, and I, I like that, that um, it's open to, and, and depending on where she comes from, colors in many ways, how the audience responds to the story. And then their relationship, it, it becomes a kind of a triangle of dependence and a kind of passion. And um, as, and ultimately, I, I believe a kind of a love story between these two women. Don't and, you think? I mean, that's, it's, not, it's not explicit, but it's there. It's okay. really, you know. It's really compelling, that part of it, the scenes between them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, You insist also that it's contemporary. Mm. I seem to uh, recall that direction in your notes. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I mean, uh, it continues. I mean, um, espionage and secrets and betrayals and nations trying to get information about what other countries are doing uh, or other organizations are up to will never end. It's it's continually um, there. And at times it um, rises to the surface and we hear about it and other times it's under the surface. Um, and in crisis moments and times of extreme war, I think God knows we may be on the brink or we're we're in in the early stages of uh, world catastrophe, or maybe we'll pull back from it. But certainly, this is a time when um, uh, knowledge about um, what is happening in in other parts of the world is um, central to um, trying to uh, provide security 
um, or not, um, as we can see in different parts of the world right now. Um, it's a 90 minute play. Why a short play? Yeah. Uh, most of my plays are short. I don't think need much needs more to be said than needs to be said. Um, mm -hmm. I don't particularly, uh, and my plays tend to be very compressed and concentrated. And so um, they're, they're in, in that case, there doesn't need to be a lot of extraneous information or scenes. Um, I, I think I can get a lot into into scenes. I, I have kind of a skill, I think, to do that, that um, you can learn a lot in a very short time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the scenes in this play are silent. Yes. <laughs> uh, I have a quotation I'd like to share with you and ask you to respond to. It's from your um, notes in the beginning of the play. Mm -hmm. Intelligence exists through facade and charade, a deadly form of theater. Related is the role of art, which you have in quotation marks, uh, in the state apparatus embodied in the figure of the cultural attache. Mm -hmm. So. I love the figure of the cultural attache. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Funnily enough, I've met one. I've gotten to know one in Berlin who, um, in fact, you said you listened to that reading of, at the at the English theater, the woman who introduced that was the newly appointed cultural attache in Berlin. And um, I think that um, it, because I've always wondered what really is the role of the cultural attache? Who is this person? And um, what might they be? Why are they here? You know, what what are they doing? You know? And, and I have a scene in the play where um, Mary, their first scene alone together, she asks her, what does a cultural attache do exactly? And the character answers, I could read that if you'd like. Um, but uh, the, of course, when I say that um, it's a form of theater, of course, these it's we're all performing all the time, as we know from sociologists. Irving Goffman, I think his name was, but but of course, um, this is a very deadly form of theater, um, espionage. So um, these people who uh, work in intelligence, of course, um, and you know, popular culture is now full of examples of these kind of characters. Um, but they they have to have strong nerves and be very very talented at performing. Uh, so that's why I call it a deadly form of theater. And um, of course, theater leads to this idea of the um, cultural attache and the arts. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we know that um, when, when, when nations and powers want to show some kind of um, uh, warming of relations, uh, they'll send dancers, or some form of entertainment, or a panda, you know, or some something. Um, there, there. These, these art is used. Art, 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 arts, artists, and art has always been used and manipulated by by those in power. And I think there's something of that in this play too, whether artists know it or not. Um, you also talk about humor in the play and the importance of that. And yeah. the character Henry could be humorous, you suggest. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about his whistling, which is um, whenever he has secret communications, uh, he whistles after he wraps it all up. Can you talk a little about that? Is that to oh. mm -hmm. ground him in the popular culture or? Well, I, I think that a play is a, an ex it's a performance. So there are many levels um, and there's a visual level, um, there's an intellectual level, but there's also a, a sound. So it's part of the soundscape of the play, it's music. So 
I leave that choice to the actor or the director, but um, there it's a it's a kind of a a theme a theme sound that that moves throughout the play. Whatever choice of um, whatever tune he chooses to hum um, becomes part of the 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 the, the total art of of the play. It's um, musical. Yeah, and it could be very funny because it depends what kind of music he chooses. Um, I don't know if we should say for your audience, give them a little sense of what the play is about. For sure. <laughs> Let's do it. I have a little free C I could read, or oh. you could read Yeah, go ahead if you'd like. A high-level intelligence officer and his wife welcome a cultural attache from a foreign country into their home and into their lives. The result is a triangle of danger and passion, a play about secrets and what they do to those who possess them. Yeah. Um, and of course, the um, title of the play is heavily ironic, I would say. Um, yeah. Safe house, because nobody in this play is safe. And that becomes um, clearer and clearer as the play goes on. Yeah. And I read further, and by extension, nobody is safe, period. But maybe I'm uh, departing too much from the. No, no. Um, one thing that is special for me about this play is that um, the, the two main characters, well, all of them actually, the three, tell stories about other people. So, and as you say, this idea that nobody is safe um, because it comes into it because they describe the lives of other people. And um, in, in many of these stories describe people who are, who are not safe either and whose lives um, are uh, deeply affected by uh, the, the um, state apparatus and this world of secretive secretive uh, secrets, secret exchanges and so on. Um, and uh, I should mention perhaps that Mary, the wife had been in, her, comes from a family of intelligence officers and worked as a young woman as a secretary um, in the uh, counterintelligence. And that's where she met Henry. And um, she has stories that I think are quite chilling <laughs> and, quite fun about um, the the secrets, the kind of secrets that these lovely young women, these all American young women are sitting there typing. The, mm -hmm. kind of, the things we can't even imagine um, that they are exposed to in terms of the, the secrets that um, we don't know about the dangers. Oh, oh, oh. Dangers and... Yeah. Well, I'd like to switch gears, if yeah. I, you don't mind, and sure. ask, um, I mean, you know, like I know how it works in fiction pretty much with book launches, but how do you market a play? Mm -hmm. um, market a play. Well, you don't really. You know, what, what happens is, you know, the in this case, the publisher has the play. He will send off blurbs about it. People will find it on the website. Um, and then an agent perhaps, you know, will send the play out to theaters and hope for a production, something like that. There's no kind of general marketing of a play doesn't doesn't work in the same way as the publishing business generally but playwright um, agents often you say yeah yeah I've, I've had a number of theater agents and um so th that's so, but you know everything's changing you know the whole the whole structure of the arts is is in a completely transformative moment so you know just like in publishing um Many people are turning to self-publishing and um, there are other ways that people are presenting their work. 
and getting it read and responded to. And I, I believe that that is also happening in the theater, um, you know, especially with what happened with the necessity of using Zoom to, um, to reach other people with um, theater. So there's a wider audience and there are other methods of reaching people. And so those old structures where you needed an agent and a literary manager and even a theater are kind of dissipating. And it may very well be for the best in many cases. There will be other ways to perform. You know, people might find work and, and get together and um, perform plays together. It could work in many different ways um, because things are much more accessible now. So in a way that's kind of exciting. Um, so I hope that my work can be a part of that now that it's available. Um. Yeah. I've always wanted to ask a playwright this question, and so this is my opportunity. Um, there was a high school production of Lillian Hellman's play, The Children's Hour, mm -hmm. which I personally think was a terrible choice, um, but they changed the ending. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Can you just change the ending of somebody's play? I mean, where does where does it begin? Well, generally you can't yeah that's what was my thinking but i i have to say that you know that that play has a long history it was also they changed the ending in the hollywood film version too you know they 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 it was a based on a um story that a scottish school teachers um um that lillian uh faderman wrote a wonderful um book about and that was the basis of this story. These two women who um, were lovers um, who started this school together. But by the time Hollywood got a hold of it, it was um, a very different story. And mm -hmm. only one of the teachers was secretly and tormentedly in love with the other. The other had a fiance. So, you know, it was. Um, and um, and it ended differently. So. Um, I think, but generally the rule is in America that, um, or perhaps I would say even in the English speaking world that you cannot change the work of an author without asking them. In Germany, it's a whole other thing. You can do whatever you want with a work. Really? Yeah. <laughs> There's no, nothing to protect. Wow. But, mm -hmm. Well, but, going along, what's your next project? Um, in and then you'll do something entirely different when we talk again. And that's wonderful. But what are your thoughts? Oh, I, I've been thinking a lot about my time as an actress, a young actress, training to be an actress. And um, that part of my life. So it may be that if I um. If, I think I may write a uh, try to write a piece of fiction about that, you know, so in some way it does relate to this play safe house, because again, you know, the concerns are um, about identity and who, who we are and uh, um, how we perform, you know, I don't know. I just, it just felt like an interesting thing to write about and something I know very well. I know the theater very well, and I know what it was like to try and be an actress, which is a very odd thing to be. Yeah. Um, so have you decided on the genre, novel, play? Oh, I, I expect it would be a form of fiction. But you never know, maybe a, some kind of memoir. <laughs> Who knows? Oh, well, that's another idea. You yeah. the that's the next thing, I guess, on unta tap territory. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now we're drawing to a close. Let me ask you if you have any final words for the audience. Mm. Did you put a picture of the, the? Were you? do you have a copy of that, of the play? Well, I put the picture up when we mentioned it. And then after we close, like we did last time, we'll put the picture up again. And um, well, No, like, like I say, my interest um, now, and you were asking about marketing and so on, I think it's, a really interesting experiment to talk about theater in a larger context to say maybe a play is something that 
you know, you can purchase, you can, you can read and think about its content and, and that it's something in itself. Um, and I, I have an essay about dialogue and um, fiction writing, as you may have seen, it's called um, A Playwright Crosses the Border into Fiction. And there I talk about the, what I believe the beauties um, and power of dialogue is, and that maybe fiction writers have not really understood what dialogue can do. And so I think that, I think there's a kind of a, an argument to be made that, um, that people just pick up plays and read them and, and um, enjoy this other way of telling stories um, and that dialogue isn't frightening, you know, and, um, it's easy to read and there's so much that goes so much that playwrights do with dialogue and you can create a whole world, develop characters, tell a story and communicate ideas through, through a play. And that's what I hope. And that's what I'd like to say to readers. And uh, yeah. So I agree with you entirely. And mm -hmm. I would think one sometimes frustrating aspect of being a playwright is that in the old days, anyway, you're kind of dependent on productions and it was uh, yeah. you know, collaborative of necessity. But now, you know, things are changing. They are, they are. Okay. Thanks, Lydia. I hope you come again with when you have the next accomplishment, you're moving best in all your very pro various projects. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Good to see you again. Good Thanks. to see you too. Bye. Hi, everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome Emma Mulvaney Stanek back to the show. Um, you've been on three or four times, I think, and you've been interviewed by both Keith and me. And it's always a pleasure to see you. Thanks um, for having me. I'd like to start um, by focusing a little on the personal, if we could. I know it kind of, you're here, you're a high powered politician, uh, but you also have a very important active personal life. And I'd like to read from your website uh, by way of introduction about your family. You just, you say about yourself, I am a mom to two small kids, a small business owner, the wife of a city employee, a former Burlington city councilor and a Vermont state representative. Uh, congratulations on the first meeting of the Vermont state representatives today. Um, I have spent years as a labor and community organizer working to make our world more equitable while ensuring that everyone is safe and everyone else feels a sense of belonging. And now I'd like to show you a picture, if you don't mind, of you and your family. It's a great <laughs> picture. Um, however, we need to move on to um, your current project, which is very exciting. You've decided to run for mayor of Burlington. And this is really an important race. It's the first mm -hmm. open seat in 12 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to say when you win, you'll be the first woman and the first lesbian mayor of Burlington. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to be debating around the around the city in the next few weeks. The mm -hmm. uh, election is what? No, March? March 5th. March. And it's a town hall. Election. Uh, it's a town meeting. It's it's town meeting. Local election. March 5th, 2024 will be the big day. Yep. Well, tell me, why did you decide to run for mayor? You're already a representative in the House. Yes, it's a great question. Um, and honestly, I've always wanted to run for mayor of Burlington. I've lived in Burlington nearly 20 years now at this point. Uh, I grew up in central Vermont, but the big city, once I moved back to Vermont after college, the big city um, always attracted me. The beautiful lake, uh, the vibrant neighborhoods, uh, so the different little economic centers throughout town between North Street and the New North End, Pine Street, and of course, downtown. Uh, there was just so much vibrancy in life, and it was always the town I would gravitate to growing up in, in uh, Barrie at the time. And so when I came back to Vermont, it it just felt like home, and I have a deep love for this community. Um, I've chosen to raise my kids here. 
Uh, I've put my roots really deeply into this community. And the reason why I'm, why I'm running, frankly, is this deep love. Uh, Burlington is have, experiencing a lot of suffering on our streets. As a mom of two small kids, as you mentioned in my bio, I have a deep commitment to making sure this community is a healthy place that where everyone can thrive, where we see each other as neighbors, uh, where we come up with solutions in a collaborative way. And as I've served in the state legislature and I come home at night, I've been really concerned around how divisive politics has become on a local level. It's 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 sort of like all of the um, the things that really are pulling our democracy apart on a national level have found their way into our local community and the blaming um, and the inability to work together. Um, and it, it just became intolerable for me. And I wanted to make sure we had different a different leadership option. Um, and I had decided actually to run regardless of whether the current mayor was gonna run again, because I felt so passionately that we needed to have different leadership. What has we've been doing in the city is not working. It's actually further pulling our community apart. Um, so I rolled up my sleeves. I had a good, honest conversation with my wife and we figured out how to do this because it takes a team effort. Becca Ballant talks a lot, Congressman Ballant talks a lot about, Congresswoman, excuse me, Ballant, um, around uh, how it's a team, it's basically a team sport to run for office, especially in this big level. And as Vermont viewers will know, running for Burlington mayor is a big deal. It's bigger than state rep. And I felt like I could also have more impact uh, on the local level uh, with the need that we're facing here if I turn my attention to running to mayor, for mayor. And you're right, spouses need to be on board. Yep, <laughs> and kids. Um, <laughs> and kids, absolutely. So what differentiates you? Right now you have one opponent, opponent mm -hmm. who's endorsed by the Democratic Party. What differentiates your candidacy from hers? And while you're talking, if you want to dispel any myths that may be circulating about you. Sure, yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, so there is one other opponent in the race at the at the time, one other candidate, and my opponent and I served together on city council about 10 plus years ago when I served uh, from 2009 to through the 2012. And at the time, and she's been pretty consistent, she's actually quite a moderate Democrat when you look at the values and the positions she's had on issues. I like to mostly talk about like what I'm standing for, my vision, but I'll tell you the big core differences so far is that uh, my opponent really is focused very narrowly on public safety and not even a broader understanding of larger community safety, but very hyper-focused on policing and using, overusing, in my opinion, criminal justice system to solve all of our problems. And frankly, I wish it were that easy, but the big distinction I would say is that I have an analysis on what our community needs that views safety as a community safety issue where multiple complexities can actually be understood at the same time, knowing that no one entity will solve the challenges of Burlington. So it is not um, how many police officers we have that will solve all the challenges we have with unhoused folks, people openly using drugs in the streets, um, people's felt sense of safety or lack thereof. Um, it's uh, it really it's it's a it's it's sort of like a false setup that that policing um, is the one single solution. And this has been a national trend in many cities across the country. Um, left candidates, Democrats in most places, are getting attacked around trying to reimagine policing and opening up this conversation of community safety in a broader way that's more holistic and identifies the fact that we need a working mental health system. We need social workers. We need frontline workers who um, are equipped with the professional background to help people in a medical crisis or a mental health crisis, um, or frankly, just there to connect people to services. And that actually is, has to be coupled with partnerships with the state, um, which is, I think, another big distinction point is the fact that I bring state policy making experience um, to uh, to this race uh, that my opponent does not. I have those relationships. I have um, an understanding how state government works. And the biggest thing is that Burlington has long had this culture of um, being separate from Vermont in the state house. There's this weird culture where Burlington is not seen as needing state support. Um, we see, we're see we seen as coming in and like telling everyone what needs to happen. And I would, as a former labor organizer, I will tell you it's fundamentally about collaboration that makes our democracy and community stronger. And I would have a much different approach that is open-handed and one that, that really connects common, um, common cause between Burlington and other communities in the state. That we know that collectively these are Vermont challenges showing up on the streets of Burlington, the housing emergency, the substance use um, emergency, the mental health crisis. This is a Vermont challenge, and this is the time to work collaboratively together and not in isolation. Um, and the last thing I would say is housing is probably the other big difference between myself and my, and my opponent. 
Um, I have a long track record of supporting affordable housing um, and, and from an economic justice lens where we need to be densifying housing in village centers. In this case in Burlington, uh, we need to remove barriers um, that have long been in place that have led to this housing emergency that include rezoning um, or upzoning, I should say, is kind of the term these days, where you change single family zoned units to allow more denser housing. So two units or three units to be built in that in that lot, in that um, uh, in that place. And my opponent has long opposed um, upzoning and prefers single uh, family units. And that has just prevented Burlington from growing as it needed to grow to make sure we have enough actual physical places for people to live. And now we're living in that reality where this structural failure has led to compounded, I would say, the problem um, that we're experiencing in the streets of Burlington. Um, as you've been campaigning uh, for this job uh, and talking to people, what do people seem most concerned about? Well, I've been door knocking for a good month now, and uh, I love door knocking. It's, I think, the most, it's a very important thing for candidates to do, even on this level, uh, because you go right to the person, you first of all, see how they're living, um, you see how they're experiencing Burlington, and you get to have a real honest conversation with people um, at their home uh, around what they think the priorities are for Burlington. I've, I've heard obviously community safety, um, but I've heard two different kind of interpretations of community safety. I hear the stories of people who, um, and mostly people who have this underlying compassion for people that they don't want to just simply consider people other and push them out of Burlington and make them out of sight, out of mind. They really want to find a compassionate solution um, that get people the services they need. Um, I've been encouraged by people's response around uh, the uh, drug and substance use disorder problem we're facing with one, again, of compassion where we need to have as many open doors for people as possible. And that includes overdose prevention centers. If we talked six months ago, I would say there's a mixed mixed reviews on that. At this point, I think most people know that's a life-saving um, tool that we must consider at this point. Um, and I would, and then, you know, in terms of the other other groupings of people, I think some people are hesitant, folks who have never, who've lived in Vermont most of their lives, perhaps not lived in a bigger city, who've not seen people camping on streets or openly using drugs in the streets or seen needles on the ground. There is this this um, this fear that people have, which is legitimate. And I think it's important for us to really break down what does safety mean? People should feel and be safe in Burlington, but I'm also concerned about how unsafe people physically are right now who are are at the point where they're suffering so, so badly that they're openly using drugs on the streets and they're living in tents in the middle of winter in, in Vermont. Like to me, that's the priority safety need. And while we work to build a safer community for everyone to thrive, where everyone truly is safe. Well, that corresponds with the three focuses of your platform, which are community safety, affordability, and livability. Um, could you talk a little about livability? I mean, it yes. all kind of ties in together. Absolutely. Well, I think that's imp um, it's important to look at policy, uh, not in a siloed fashion, but really about how things are interdependent and um, either help each other when you think about it holistically or um, you can create harmful policy when you're too siloed in your in your thinking. So for livability, that actually that that piece of my platform started with just a, a focus on climate, and I actually expanded it to include people and safe communities. After talking with over 100 plus people when I was in the listening portion of my campaign as a good organizer, it's about you have two ears and one mouth. And it's important to listen to people to help inform what is really needed in the city because the people have that wisdom. I truly believe that. Um, and I expanded it because it's one thing to have a, um, a, a healthier uh, environment and working towards really uh, with some urgency, our climate emergency. And another piece of that is livable for the actual people as well. And there's nothing that um, so starkly tells us that we have to work on that than the, the, um, the shootings of the three Palestinian students uh, not too long ago at this hateful violence. It's again, right here, as I mentioned before about the divisiveness, hate is also here in Vermont. Um, it's here in Burlington and we have to be conscious in our attempts to build an inclusive community where people feel they like belong and they safely are, can live here regardless of their identities, whether it be racial identity, gender identity or sexual identity. This is truly about consciously bringing that to mind. And frankly, the fact that we've never elected a female mayor or an LGBTQ mayor before, that matters because when people don't have that lived experience and they're sitting at decision tables, they move with either less or more urgency because they know exactly what that's like 
to um, to experience racism. We've never elected a person of color for that matter either. Either experience racism or homophobia or transphobia. Um, it's it matters. It matters to have those people in decision making places. I agree entirely. I have a question about the lake. As I told you before, we tape. We started taping. I have a friend who's an expert um, who says that this is a little long. That the big problem at the lake that concerns Burlington is the cyanobacteria blooms. You know mm -hmm. about them, I'm mm -hmm. sure. They cause so many beach closures. Uh, part of this is caused by warming climate, so that's a larger issue that the mayor um, can't address directly. Mm -hmm. But reducing car carbon emissions can help. The more immediate thing would be for Burlington to expand expand its wastewater capacity so that the heavy rainstorms, you know all this probably. I, it was news to me, but I thought I'd ask you about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting So we're getting these heavy rainstorms due to the warming climate and they overflow into untreated, they overflow untreated sewage into the lake, mm -hmm. which raises the nutrient levels, which directly feeds those cyanobacteria blooms. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, Anything a mayor can do to reduce runoff into the lake would help reduce the pollution getting into the lake and causing these problems. So um, as mayor, how would you respond to the, how would you reduce the pollution getting into the lake? Mm -hmm. Well, it is again, it's Burlington has to play its role, but it's also about upstream communities, right? So it's about um, making sure that there is, a, a again, collective understanding that the lake is um, multiple communities' responsibilities, not just Burlington. We are the biggest city on the lake. Um, we play our role, but it's bigger than us. And we do have a combined sewer um, system, which means that both uh, rainwater from storms goes into the same pipes as our sewer, and it overloads the system with a, a sewer treatment plant, or we have three of them technically in Burlington. They do get overwhelmed when there's that high flow of these 100-year storms that are happening way more frequently than 100 years. Um, and so moving um, stormwater off of that system as much as possible is critical. And also acknowledging though, that as we hold this other, other priority of needing to build more housing urgently, that continues to put more pressure on our infrastructure. So our sewer treatment, sewage treatment plants were built to support a city much smaller than the one we're trying to grow into. So um, we're we really have to grapple and pace this reality of um, doing investments and upgrades to our sewage treatment plant to handle the increased demand on it um, while uh, realizing that that takes investment, that takes significant investment, um, which we have to sequence with all the other needs of Burlington. Um, the other piece, of course, is that it's not just what gets pushed out in a storm, um, a storm which uh, is is notable, but also it is it is gets it, just for the record, so folks know it gets pushed way out into the middle of the lake um, in terms of where it actually gets discharged, uh, which is there's a lot of dilution there. The other major contributor, frankly, though, is phosphorus that's coming in and all of the feeding rivers and streams into the lake. And this is again why I really want to emphasize: yes, Burlington has a role on it, but there's a lot of sewage treatment plants that are, that sit on rivers upstream of Lake Champlain. There's farmlands that have lots of, lots of phosphorus that wash into um, these rivers that wash into the lake. And then when we have big storm events like the flooding this last summer, um, though that really spikes the amount of phosphorus that gets pushed into the lake, which frankly contributes even more to these um, to these blooms. And uh, it's, you know, for the first time, because also climate change is happening, the lake, a lot of people are actually cold dipping now in the lake and whatnot. So this is a, a year long um challenge now because the lake doesn't freeze anymore and people are accessing the lake throughout the year. So quality of life is dramatically impacted as well as just frankly the um uh the actual ecosystems when we when we don't handle this with the kind of urgency that's needed. So there's a there's a lot to do, um, but it's bigger than Burlington, while Burlington also needs to do its part. Oh interesting. I learned a lot from that answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um I have one more question that calls for a little reflection. Um You've been, I think you started your involvement with electoral politics in 2006 when you worked for Scudder Parker's campaign and you were a community organizer before that. So you've been involved and you majored in political science at Smith. So you, um, you've been involved in politics for much of your adult life um, and things have changed. Mm -hmm. as, you're think as you reflect on your years as a politician, how has your thinking changed? And um, more broadly, how have things changed in the mm. political 
climate? That's a mm-hmm. huge question. I love it though. It's a great question. And actually I would probably say my political career started when I was age three because my dad ran at the time for Washington State Senate and we lived in Marshfield at the time. I have somehow Marshfield was in that district. I think I have the district right. Anyway, I remember handing out flyers as three at the Marshfield General Store. So that's really when I got started. So um, just so we can and, update. And your grandmother was a real active Democrat. Is that right? Yes, in Long Island of all places, which, you know, in the <laughs> 50s go. and 60s, holy moly, taking on that role. Yeah, she was a spitfire. I literally get all of my, um, that energy from her. I'm, I'm, she was a strong Sicilian woman. I love her. She was, she was great. And also about like four foot eight, I think she was very short, <laughs> but lots of, lots of fiery power. Um, it's a really a great reflection question because uh, I think great leaders or good leaders at least have this, have the ability to reflect about how things are not linear And one should um, have a practice in reflection to know um, how and when to adjust. Uh, And one one thing I've really learned over the years, uh, because I first served in my elected capacity, at least in 2009 as a city councilor, is that most of the the elected roles in Vermont are so part-time that you have to be a generalist um, and you have to really understand how to be effective with that really tricky setup structurally, right? Like you're very part-time and most people have to hold another job in order to do even do public service. So I've learned a lot about capacity. I've learned how to try to narrow my focus to really hone in on things that I can really specialize in so I can be effective in that work rather than trying to be um, perfect and an expert on all policy areas. It's really, it's really not possible, which has really fed my understanding and my deep commitment to working for collaboration and working towards compromise because you have to rely on your colleagues. That's actually the best of democracy is when you have that trust to be able to really rely on each other to develop things together because uh, at least in the legislature, there's multiple committees. There's also committees on city council, of course, um, to do that work and to do some of the vetting and then be able to um, build upon that um, initial thinking. So I've learned collaboration. I've learned around uh, narrowing my focus. I've also learned you can't die on every hill. I mean, I come from an activist background and man, in my early years, I was like, everything has to be like for the, if I have a worker background, right? Like workers justice background, everything has to be for workers and everything has to have this high level of labor standard or something. And I've learned that um, you cannot do that on every single issue because you become ineffective that way because um, that is not a headspace of bringing true collaboration to the table. If you are certain on your, on how right you are, and it must be this absolute perfect, perfect version in my head, at least of, of policy, otherwise nothing else is acceptable. I learned that pretty quickly um, that you can't be effective that way. And that's actually not how best policy is made because it, it, that skews towards, you know, just my way of thinking. And there's, we have to really broadly represent our neighborhoods, our districts, um, our city. So it's been it's been wonderful, though. I have to say, it's the best job I've ever held. I've always tr- I've always considered my day jobs the way I can do my political work um, over the years. Uh, I wish that Vermont can get to a day where I see a day where we can make these jobs a little bit more livable for folks, so that it could be more accessible. I've been a long time advocate of legislator compensation and changing that system in the state house. So that working people, that demographic of like 20 to 50 can actually be better represented in that building because it's not, especially people who have young children who are working parents. Um, we, as I said before, representation matters. Same thing for this demographic. We, um, the policymakers set an agenda and a set of priorities often based on like how they see the world. And when there's a whole big swath of our population missing, um, those priorities get skewed um, to really um, off of what uh, I think working families in particular need. So um, my hope is that this this lovely and amazing democracy that I love so much in Vermont and in the city of Burlington becomes even more accessible for folks, those who choose to be elected. Um, but the last thing I'll just say is I've also seen a lot around how um, community engagement is a vital part of this de- democratic experiment that we're we're living in. And uh, another reason why I'm running for mayor, frankly, is that that the community engagement has become very opaque and um, um, challenged here in the city. If, if people watch city council meetings, they are harmful. They're um, aggressive. Um, they're very transactional. They're everything that, like, frankly, um, would turn any feeling or thinking person off of local local politics and government. And I would want a real sea change there in um, in that approach to how people get in, engaged in the city, how they can give input, how they can even receive and understand what the city's working on. Um, because I think we've truly let that 
become a failing system now. And I want people to walk into City Hall um, and feel like they belong there, that their ideas and input matter, and that there's multiple places along the process that they could provide input and not have it be the night of the big decision where you're tying for two minutes and you're packed in like sardines and the tensions are high. That should be rare, if ever. Um, and that's another piece that I've learned over the years that um, the best policy doesn't come out of those conditions. The best policy comes out of a place where the community feels they belong and they know what they, how, their voice, how to use their voice in the process. Well, I applaud you for jumping into the fray because people are leaving. You yes. Know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and you think that we're sort of in a cycle of negativity or? Um... Could you, Anne, could you just repeat that question? Sure. Are, are, do you think the country is in a cycle of negativity or even in the world, or is it just, um, you know, something that we can work through? It's not apocalyptic. You say that one more time. Sorry, my technology failed me for a hot second. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, you think that this, uh, we can work with the current negativity and um, emerge triumphant or at least working with each other. And your experience uh, working on the Commerce Committee, the House Commerce Committee, where you collaborated with a lot of people, some of whom had different um, political views, demonstrates that you're able to do that. Yeah, the only way I'm a um, I'm a, a progressive. I, those values um, align most with my politics. Um, but in the state house, I'm one of five progressives in a body of 150. So that has deeply taught me how you really have to rely on your relationship building skills. You have to rely on collaboration um, because again, if you die on every hill and you're not willing to kind of build, work towards understanding. Um, you'll never get people to consider um, your take on things and, and sort of like a, a, a progressive minded piece of policy. And so the Commerce Committee has taught me a lot. It's, it is the most moderate committee. It's chaired by a Northeast Kingdom Republican um, who's lovely, but it's it's a di very different working space than um, even I was used to for coming out of the Burlington political scene. So uh, I, I've learned to be effective. I've learned how to get policy and new ideas into bills where I don't think it would have been considered before. But the only reason that's been um, the case is because I have strong relationships I've built with my colleagues um, and shown my process for how I um, develop that idea or ask a series of questions that led to helping most impacted people like BIPOC owned businesses, for example, um, be able to tell their stories in the legislative space where they have often not been asked or not been invited in. So um, that is, I think it's very much possible. And um, and I think it's it's not gonna be overnight because uh, culture takes time to shift. Um, but I think this is a huge opportunity for Burlington to set a different tone. Um, and I hope that's that happens with my election. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Anne. I appreciate the time. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.